Welcome to the regular meeting of the Public Health and Safety Committee for January 31st, 2024. I am Jason Chavez and I am the chair of this committee. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify the presence of a quorum. Council Member Payne. Present. Rainville. Present. Ellison. Here. Paul Masano. Present. Vice Chair Wansley is absent. Chair Chavez. Present. There are five members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. I also want to welcome Councilman Revita to the committee. With that, the agenda today is before us. Our first item is a public hearing on the appointment of the Civil Rights Commission. Here's the kickoff of the public hearing. Uh, Kayla, the Director of Complaint Investigations Division. Hi, Council Members, Chair Chavez. Thank you so much for having me. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kayla McCannantiera. I'm the Director of the Complaint Investigations Division within the Civil Rights Department. Um, and we are the ones that provide the staff support to the Civil Rights Commission. So it's my pleasure to be here to introduce the recommended um, new commissioners for that commission. Before I jump into that too much, just a little background on the Civil Rights Commission itself. It is a 21-member commission that promotes and protects um, the civil rights of the residents of Minneapolis, and they do this in a variety of different ways. Um, they do public outreach and engagement and education. Uh, they also take leadership in civil rights issues. They provide um, recommendations and advice to elected officials in the city on civil rights issues. And they also play a really important adjudicative role in our civil rights uh, discrimination cases that the department investigates and makes decisions on. Um, those cases, when we do make a decision, are there's a right to an appeal, and those appeals are reviewed by members of the Civil Rights Commission. So they play a really important role in that way as well. Um, so I'll go through those um these folks that we're recommending to, to move forward, we're really grateful for a really um, good set of folks that applied who all bring um, really unique perspectives and experiences that really will serve the commission well. So the first person um, on our list is Mark Stignani. He is up for reappointment. Um, he currently serves on the commission. He's from Ward 11. Uh, he served on the commission since 2021, and he's an active member of the Standards and Procedures Subcommittee, as well as the Workforce and Contract Compliance Subcommittee. Committee. He is a licensed attorney. He has served on the Giving Committee at Thomson Reuters and was an early participant in Books for Africa. He's particularly interested in continuing to serve in his attorney capacity uh, to promote and protect civil rights. He's proposed to fill seat one, which is an attorney seat and a mayoral appointment. The next person is Tiara Brown. She is from Ward 4. She's also a licensed attorney and is actually a former investigator with the Complaint Investigations Division. So she is very familiar with this work. Um, and she currently works as a resolution and compliance specialist at Minneapolis Public Schools. She's proposed to fill seat two, uh, also an attorney seat and a mayoral appointment. Uh, next, we have Zamzam Mohammed. She is from Ward 5 and works as a small business advisor in Hennepin County. She also supports different law firms in the Twin Cities, working as an interpreter and helping attorneys engage with the diverse community in Minneapolis to provide culturally competent legal services and volunteers with a variety of other organizations as well. She is proposed to fill seat three, also a mayoral appointment. Next is William Pentelovich uh, from Ward 7. He is a licensed attorney and has worked with the NAACP, Planned Parenthood, and the American Civil Liberties Union of Minnesota. He has been practicing law for 50 years uh, and is focused only on pro bono work at this time. He is proposed to fill seat four. This is an attorney seat and a mayoral appointment. Next, we have Camille Dacane. He is from Ward 6. He's worked in the security interest industry for the past 13 years and is highly involved in the East African and Somali community, particularly in the Phillips neighborhood. Um, and he or is a part of a variety of organiza organizations, including Kajog, which puts on the Somali Independence Day event. He is proposed to fill seat 5 uh, and is a mayoral appointment. Next is Anne Marie Shute. She is up for reappointment, currently serves on the commission. Uh, she has been serving since 2023. She's an active member of the Standards and Procedures Committee, a licensed attorney, and currently works on civil rights um, cases and is an investigator for the University of Minnesota uh, and previously practiced civil rights law, primarily representing plaintiffs um, suing their former employers. She's also a board member for the Family Tree Clinic in Minneapolis. She's proposed to fill seat six. This is an attorney seat um, and a mayoral appointment. 
Next, we have Viviana Salazar. She is from Ward 5, works as a supervisor for the University of Minnesota Physicians, and is the leader of their Latin Employment Resource Group. She's also actively involved in the community and started a folklore dance group for youth in North Minneapolis. She is proposed to fill seat seven in a mayoral appointment. Next, we have Hassan Al-Sadiq, who lives just outside the city, but has a lot of ties to the city. He, lives, uh, he used to live in the city and then also has done a variety of work with organizations in Minneapolis, including YouthLink, the Minneapolis NAACP, and Juxtaposition Arts. He is a youth advocate and has served on the Urban League Young Professionals Board and many other community organizations. Uh, he's focused on youth empowerment, particularly workforce development for youth on non-traditional pathways. He has proposed to fill seat 11 and is a mayoral appointment. And then lastly, uh, Sheila Scott is up for reappointment. She has served on the commission since uh, last year and is an active member of the Workforce and Contract Compliance Subcommittee. She is also a licensed attorney, former public defender, um, and has also worked as a human rights investigator for the state of Minnesota and on contract compliance there. Um, she is proposed to fill seat 15, uh, which is an attorney seat and a council appointment. With that, I'm very open to any questions you might have for me, and then we do have one prospective commissioner here, um, Hassan Al-Sadiq, who'd like to make a statement as well. Thank you, Director. And for my colleagues, speaker management is now up, so if you want to get on cue, I'll be checking that to allow you time to speak. If there's no, Director, you may go ahead. Great. All right. I will actually hand it over to Hassan. me, ladies and gentlemen, um, esteemed council members and community members and fellow justice advocates. I stand before you today with a deep sense of purpose and conviction, expressing my acceptance of the appointment to a leadership role on the Minneapolis Commission on Civil Rights. As a third generation black Minnesotan with firsthand experience of existing systemic inequalities, I am deeply committed to addressing intergenerational disparities and empowering youth leadership. Our nation faces urgent challenges in racial and social justice necessitating action. I've seen the enduring inequalities affecting marginalized communities and feel compelled to bridge these gaps. I wanna express or emphasize, I mean, rather, uh, the importance of including Generation Z in leadership roles, their passion, energy, and innovation, innovative thinking are invaluable assets, and they've been instrumental in movements for social justice and equality. My vision is to serve as a bridge between generations, fostering collaboration and mentorship. Intergenerational dialogues will shape our strategies, ensuring relevance and lasting change. <clears throat> Pardon me. Inclusion of Generation Z isn't just symbolic, it's essential for innovation and lasting impact. I pledge to champion this inclus inclusive vision, advocating for youth engagement and mentorship, and together we can work to build a stronger, more equitable Minneapolis that reflects our community's diversity. Thank you for entrusting me with this appointment, and I eagerly accept the opportunity to serve and lead with you on the Minneapolis Commission on Civil Rights. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment to the city of Minneapolis and welcome. This is the open public hearing. If you did sign up uh, to talk about your appointments, please sign up with the clerks. If not, we can proceed with our business. I also want to welcome uh, Vice Chair Wansley for the public record and welcome Councilman Osman, who is a guest in committee, along with Councilman Vita. Seeing that no one else wishes to speak on this item, I'll now close the public hearing. Is there any discussion on this item? Con Councilmember Ellison. Uh, thank you, Chair Chavez. I had to step out just for a brief second, but I got to catch the tail end of, uh, of uh, Hassan Idoyas Kais, boss man, AKA. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we couldn't be more lucky as a city to have somebody like you enforcing civil rights here. And I see a lot of names on here that I really admire, uh, but to see folks who are, you know, maybe 
younger than us here on the council and, uh, uh, and, uh, and stepping into this role and wanting leadership here. Um, you know, I've known you a long time, and so uh, your leadership here is much needed and much appreciated. So uh, just if my colleagues didn't know, you know, the kind of greatness we had in front of us, I wanted it to be, be known. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison. Uh, seeing no further discussion, I will move approval of this item. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. That item carries, and this item will be forwarded to the next council meeting. There are nine items on the consent agenda today. Item number two is authorizing a revenue <coughs> contract with SMG for bomb detection services at U.S. Bank Stadium. Item number three is authorizing a revenue contract with the Minnesota Twins for bomb detection security services at Target Field. Item number four is authorizing a revenue contract with the University of Minnesota for bomb detection services at Huntington Bank Stadium. Item number five is authorizing a revenue contract with the Minnesota Timberwolves to provide bomb detection at Target Center. Item number six is authorizing a revenue contract with SMG for SWAT services at U.S. Bank Stadium. Item number seven is authorizing a mutual aid contract with Dunwoody for collaboration in assisting crime victims and prosecution of crimes. Item number eight is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health for Minneapolis school-based clinics. Item number nine is approving an appointment to the Public Health Advisory Committee. Item number 10 is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health for a response to emergencies at the local level. Are there any discussion on these items or would anyone like to pull these items out? Council President Payne. Thank you, Chair Chavez. Uh, I was wondering if the, any staff could speak on the school-based clinics grant and whether or not there are other high schools that are gonna be under consideration for the rest of the year. I know that not every high school was included in that item. I'm not sure if we do have staff that's here to speak on that though. Thank you, President Payne. If we have staff that can help answer that question, I think we have staff coming up right now. I was in the other room. My name is Barbara Kyle. I'm the manager of the Minneapolis School-Based Clinics and the Health Department. Um, thank you for the question. Um, we are focused on um, the clinics that we put in the grant are clinics that we could use additional services. Wellstone moved down the street from the Fair School, and so we're really focused on that school. And South and Edison, we knew that they needed more resources. We have other funding and other grants that we are providing similar um, services at our other school-based clinics. So we're thinking of the whole, but we're emphasizing these five. So then as a follow-up, is this elevating the level of service at these specific schools and the other schools that are not listed might have that level of service right now? Or I just want to make sure I'm understanding it. Seem to be similar with our other sites based on the needs of the clients in the schools. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, Council President Payne. I also want to welcome Council Vice President Chuck Tai as the guest of the committee as well. Uh, seeing no further discussion, I will move approval of the consent agenda. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. That carries and the consent agenda is approved. The next item is receiving and filing a report on pollution control issues. Here to present this item is Ben Zimmerman from the Budget Office and Patrick Handelin from the Health Department. Director, thank you for being here today. Here, Chavez, council members, uh, this is my first time with the new digs here. My name is Patrick Hanlon. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Sustainability, Healthy Homes and Environment. Uh, give me one second and I'll pull the report up here. I'm going to roll through it. There we go. Okay, so thank you. Um, council members, uh, this is a uh, presentation on the Pollution Control Annual Registration Program and Fees. It's a legislative directive brought forward by Council Member Wansley, so we're responding to that legislative directive. 
The legisl legislative directive components are item number one, a comprehensive report on the city's current pollution control annual registration PCAR fees. Uh, item number two is an updated fee schedule for 2025 that accounts for inflation, current staffing levels uh, that are needed uh, to be success to successfully oversee and manage the PCAR portfolio and any other factors that impact the fee rate. Now, item number three is an overview of current pollution mitigation programs. So that's work that's done to reduce pollution uh, using the funds and available PCAR licenses and the frequency of the util utilization of those programs. Item number four is recommendations on the addition of any pollutants currently not on the list, including carbon dioxide. So I'll, we'll run through the report. We had uh, uh, Jenny Lansing, our uh, senior project analyst, is not here today, was supposed to give this presentation. And then our environmental engineer is out. Ben Zimmerman, who you listed, uh, is also out today. Uh, there's, there's some health issues going on. So uh, Lindsay Erdman is going to uh, be presenting with me from finance. So the first uh, piece, uh, there's a comprehensive report that goes along with this presentation that's in your packet. It's on the pollution control registration uh, equipment processes. Uh, PCARs are used for any piece of equipment. There's roughly 80 pieces of equipment. Anything that adversely impacts human health directly or has the potential to adversely impact public health, human health, or the natural environment. This is a breakdown of the general categories of those 80 plus pieces of equipment. Wastewater discharge, things that could be spilled into our sanitary sewer, boilers, furnaces, ovens, afterburners, anything that, that combusts and directly pollutes here in the city, exhaust systems that could be uh, vectors for polluting, cyclones, bag filters, scrubbers, precipitators. Uh, those items are actually uh, reduced pollution. So those are items that we track in the city, but we do not charge a pollution control fee for those. We just want to know where they're at, but we encourage those items to be in our city, of course. Uh, and then paint booths and drying booths, those, those pieces of equipment uh, are related to the pollution uh, used, the chemicals used in those processes. And example is as Council President Payne uh, with some of the automotive work in, in switching over to cleaner processes in the automotive industry. Uh, so there's less charge for less polluting activities. Industrial wastewater discharge, industrial waste generators, chemical storage. We work with our partners at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency at Hennepin County for registering all of these different chemicals that are in the city uh, and making sure that we're registering those, uh, those chemicals that are in our city and their potential to pollute. Wells, those are sources of contamination, potential contamination into our groundwater. So we want to make sure that we're tracking where those locations are across the city uh, and making sure that we don't have uh, issues regarding pollution getting into our underwater, uh, our groundwater supply. And then there's air emissions. This was in 2015. We uh, brought forward changes to our pollution control registrations that charges directly for criteria pollution here in Minneapolis. And that is the argument for that is when you pollute in a heavily populated area like Minneapolis, that impacts more people's health than it does just broadly across the state. So we want to make sure that we charge uh, more for that pollution here in Minneapolis and help to fund the work that we're doing in reducing pollution. The uh, comprehensive report uh, is uh, we look at the costs for management of the PCAR portfolio, and Lindsay is probably going to go into it in, further, uh, in depth further, but looking at what it costs to run the program, including, including inspections, administration, uh, and again, mitigation of pollution to reduce pollution. This past year in 2023, council approved a 6% fee increase for PCARs. So uh, it's good to have that context going into this conversation is that uh, the cost recovery, recovery ratio was looked at this past year. Uh, and then also is good for context that in 2024, we have over 5,000 uh, facilities that are being charged a pollution control annual registration bill. And those are the dollar amounts that come in with that program. And with that, I can hand it over to Ms. Erdman. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Chavez, members of the committee. My name is Lindsay Erdman. I'm a budget analyst with Finance and Property Services, and I will be presenting on uh, question two from this legislative directive. So before we get uh, more in depth with the analysis and findings, it is helpful to be upfront with some of the key takeaways. Some of the material I'm presenting here may feel repetitive, uh, but this analysis and response is complex, so I wanna make sure sufficient information is provided to help you navigate the response. 
Uh, two general takeaways. First and foremost, this response is guided by the city's financial policies and state statute. Namely, we need to ensure we don't overcollect fee revenue in relation to the cost of PCAR administration and enforcement. In terms of methodology, the PCAR cost of mitigation is quantified and included in this analysis directly in response to the legislative directive's request to account for any other factors that impact the fee rate. This is notable in that historically this has not this is not a typical fee study cost and not one that was included in prior PCAR fee studies. In terms of actual findings, there are three key takeaways, and you will hear more about how we reach these conclusions in subsequent slides. First, under status quo PCAR enforcement, meaning the existing budgeted PCAR enforcement, there is no room to introduce new fees or increase existing fees. Second, adding additional FTEs needed to successfully oversee and manage the PCAR portfolio, as was uh, requested in the legislative directive, provides some capacity to raise fees modestly. I will note that there is a risk associated with approving fee increases prior to FTEs being adopted in the 2025 budget. Specifically, the city runs the risk of raising revenue in excess of the cost of enforcement if the additional FTEs are not adopted into the budget first. Lastly, there is a process for establishing fees for new pollutants. Um, if city leadership or policymakers determine there is a need or desire for administration, enforcement, or mitigation as it pertains to additional pollutants, then the city uh, needs to undertake the essential work of defining what the enforcement and or mitigation work looks like, fleshing out costs, and adopting a budget to implement that work. From there, we can revisit the analysis to help inform how to establish and set fees to generate revenue to support that new work. We've created a roadmap to guide this discussion as there are a few asks in question two, and this will help provide some structure to the presentation and to provide context for how this analysis should be thought through sequentially. So the end goal of the response to question two is an updated 2025 schedule in accordance with specific requests. To get there, first is part one, a 2025 fee study of status quo enforcement. This fee study is a comparison of the expenses and revenues associated with the current enforcement of PCAR. Again, notable that we are quantifying the PCAR cost of mitigation for the first time in this study, specifically in response to the LD's request. Next is part two, the 2025 fee schedule recommendation under status quo enforcement. As a reminder, we can only charge revenues up to the cost of enforcement and not above. Given that, we will discuss appropriate changes to existing fees that are uh, given the status quo cost of enforcement. Next is part three, a 2025 fee study inclusive of potential new staffing costs. From here, we take the status quo fee study from part one in this slide and layer in potential new staffing costs as requested in the LD. Next is part four, the 2025 fee schedule increase alternatives assuming the addition of potential new staffing costs. Here I'll outline changes to existing fees that are appropriate given status quo of enforcement plus layering of the potential new um, staffing costs. Note that the first two boxes are blue because they are informed by the adopted budget and the next two boxes are gray because they are in a sense theoretical. They are taking into consideration costs which are not yet in the budget. So we wanted to distinguish these two parts of the analysis for you. So what is a fee study? I've referenced this term uh, throughout the presentation but to center the conversation I wanted to provide a little bit more information. First, it's guided by our financial policy section 3.5 and state statute chapter 477A.016. Section 3.5 of our financial policies regarding license, permit, and user fees states that the city may implement charges, but said charges may not exceed the cost of providing the services. A fee study is a tool to ensure revenue collections do not exceed the cost of enforcement. It provides a comparison of revenues and expenses, and the end product is a recovery ratio. You can see the equation here on the slide. Uh, methodologically, it is grounded in budgeted enforcement costs. Per our financial policies, a recovery ratio cannot exceed 100%. Furthermore, when grappling with operations supported by fees, such as PCAR, with recovery ratios appro approaching the upper bound of the recovery ratio, meaning 100%, it is a perspective of finance to advise and share a matter of common practice to target recovery ratio ratios closer to a maximum of 90%. A 90% target provides sufficient buffer in the event of fluctuating expenses and or revenues from year to year. 
So getting into the actual analysis and findings. First is part one from the roadmap. Again, this is the status quo PCAR enforcement, so not taking into consideration any new costs. You can see the cost types broken out in accordance with the table uh, from the prior slide. The total expense figure at the bottom establishes the ceiling for the amount of revenue that can be collected to support PCAR enforcement, which is about $2.7 million. Uh, to round out the fee study, we also needed to look at revenues. So in this chart, the top blue bar is a visualization of the expenses from the prior slide. The red bar is the revenue forecast for 2025, uh, which includes that 6% increase that um, uh, Patrick had mentioned before. And as you can see, when comparing the expenses and revenue forecast, the recovery ratio is 96.6%. Next is part two from the roadmap, the 2025 fee schedule recommendation under status quo enforcement. In the first row of this table, we've incorporated the current revenue forecast and co corresponding recovery ratio from the part one fee study. In the subsequent rows, we have the same fee increase, increase alternatives, which we modeled to see the corresponding impact on the recovery ratios. That being said, the current forecast without any fee increases coincides with a projected 96.6% recovery ratio. This does fall below the 100% ceiling of our financial policies and state statute, but it is above an advisable 90% target. Accordingly, under status quo enforcement, there is no room to introduce new fees or existing fees, and staff would recommend holding fees flat from 2024 to 2025. Next is part three from the roadmap. As noted earlier in the presentation, this step is simply layering the additional potential new staffing costs onto part one uh, of the fee study. The Health Department has identified a need for two additional FTEs at point A FTE equivalency, each to support existing PCAR work. Those positions are an admin analyst two and an environmental specter, inspector two. The inclusion of these costs increases the expense input of the fee study by the amount in, the, uh, in bullet point one. This lowers the recovery ratio to 90.4%. Lastly is part four from the road ramp. A summary of 2025 fee schedule increase alternatives assuming the addition of new staffing costs. Again, as with the table in part two of this presentation, this table outlines the forecasted recovery ratio coinciding with the existing fee levels as well as the same three increase um, alternatives. Though the earlier analysis in part two confirms there is currently no room to increase fees given the recovery ratio of 96.6%, the potential increase um, and the cost of enforcement added in part three of this analysis may provide room to increase fees. Without any fee increases, a 90.4% 90 90 recovery ratio is forecasted. This falls below the 100% ceiling of our financial policies and state statute and is roughly in line with the advisable 90% target. Accordingly, there is capacity for a modest increase that leans closer to the lower end alternatives in this table. Lastly, I will again note the risk associated with increasing PCAR fees prior to new enforcement costs being adopted in the budget by council. Specifically, the city runs the risk of raising revenue in excess of the cost of enforcement if the additional FTEs are not adopted into the budget. To bring this all together, the summary slide aligns the findings for four parts of this response. In part one, we shared the status quo PCAR enforcement recovery ratio of 96.6%. In part two, shared the recommendation of no new fee increases or no new fees in 2025 under status quo enforcement. In part three, we modified the fee study to include potential new staffing costs, and this lowered the recovery ratio to 90.4%. Part four, taking into consideration the potential new staffing costs, there's capacity for modest increases to recover the cost of the additional FTEs. And we again noted the process risks involved with increasing fees before adopting the budget for the expenses the fee increases are meant to cover. Lastly, a note regarding potential new pollutants and the PCAR schedule. This portion of the response does not take into consideration any additional pollutants which are discussed in response to question four of the legislative directive. If city leadership or policymakers determine there is a need or desire for enforcement, administration, or mitigation as it pertains to additional pollutants, then the city needs to uh, define what the enforcement and or mitigation work looks like, flesh out the costs, and adopt a budget to implement that work. From there, we can revisit the analysis to help inform how to establish and set fees to generate revenue to support that new work. And from there, I'll hand it back over.
Chair Chavez, Council Members, I've just got two quick slides to wrap up here, or a, a couple of quick slides to wrap up. Uh, so this is the mitigation. The, the question was asked, I don't know what that is, uh, overview of current pollution mitigation programs available to PCAR and licensees and the frequency of utilization. These are examples of uh, pollution mitigation projects that we have that are unique to Minneapolis using these uh, fee structures, and we really focus on the mitigation uh, of the pollution, so uh, using solar, um, solar group purchase, energy efficiency. These are ways that we can reduce uh, direct pollution here in Minneapolis as well as indirect that comes from our energy production. We have innovative pollution uh, uh, reduction projects. Automotive, as I mentioned, uh, Council President Payne uh, championed a lot of that automotive work in reducing direct pollution here in Minneapolis. And in, the, in your report on this, uh, it has the, the amount of pollution with these PCAR licensees. Um, so the only chart that I kept in here was uh, for the, the dollar amounts, just so that you can see when we talk about the mitigation costs, uh, that fluctuates year to year depending on how many licensees take advantage of these programs. And there's an additional uh, context to have is that when uh, we have more funding that's available to do this work uh, that we can, like was made possible through the ARPA funding, that we can do more pollution mitigation work in the city. Uh, and so this chart kind of highlights that. And then the rest of the information related to percentage of utilization or the amount of utilization is in your report. It's between 1.5 and 2% of licensees that are using these programs currently. Uh, and like I said, if there's more funding available, uh, it, we'd get a higher percentage of, of utilization of those programs. Question number four is recommendation on the addition of any pollutants currently not on the list, including carbon dioxide. Obviously, carbon dioxide and what we're calling in this report CO2 equivalent, so looking at anything that's related to climate change and pollution. And what we really looked at in this chart, it's a simple little chart, uh, but we broke down pollution and uh, sources of pollution of CO2 equivalent that are not covered through what we just passed last year and you all passed last year with our franchise fee and getting at doing mit mitigation work that way through our gas and electric franchise fee. And so we're looking at pollution that's outside of those sources. Um, and so these are the general breakdowns of, uh, of CO2 equivalent, and the number to really pay attention to is on the lower right-hand corner, 28,000 tons of CO2 equivalent pollution in Minneapolis annually that's equivalent to a little over 5,000 homes worth of, worth of energy. Uh, so a, a significant source of uh, CO2 equivalent pollution. Next steps, it sounds like we are in line uh, with Councilmember Wansley in the legislative directive that's included in the packet here uh, is looking at enforcement and uh, mitigation work to be defined moving forward. Lindsay uh, Erdman also referenced that and to evaluate CO2 equivalent uh, potential, including the cost of administration, enforcement, mitigation, uh, and then speaking with health, finance, and different city departments to come forward with uh, what that program would look like. Uh, and then also, I, we're just giving you general pollution numbers. There would be a process of looking at what those individual uh, polluters are, and sometimes we think of those polluters as large industry, but the reality is that some of those some of those folks are schools, they are hospitals that have backup generators. If power if there's power outage, should we just uh, need to be uh, make sure that those folks are informed if any kind of additional fees or PCAR program is coming forward, and then when the enforcement and mitigation uh, work is implemented, then we establish fees to recover new enforcement and mitigation costs, and it seems like that's on track with uh, what Council Member Wansley had in her legislative directive, and that's the last piece. I know folks are waiting for a lot of other items to come up here, so I can stand for questions. Thank you, Mayor Hanlon and Lindsay for that presentation. I do have my colleagues on queue. I'll pass it to Vice Chair Wansley. Thank you, Chair Chavez. Uh, thank you to the Health Department for doing this research. As you emphasize, my office submitted this legislative directive um, after hundreds of residents uh, are basically organized across the city uh, behind the People's Climate and Equity Plan and asked council to specifically look at expanding uh, the PCAR program to include uh, carbon specifically. And I'm glad that we have these recommendations now. I will name uh, the frustration around it taking over, over a year to get here. Um, but I do recall, though, and you somewhat touched on this in terms of staffing capacity, but when we met, you mentioned um, that there some of the delays might have been attributed to capacity problems and uh, possibly to 
kind of, you know, deal with that, bringing in external contractors uh, to help support this research. Can you name uh, which contractors were brought in, be it locally or nationally, and the scope of work that they really focused on to get us this report? Sure. I, yeah, I think when this, I mean, the evaluating pollution control annual registrations, and you're right, MN 350 and the coalition of partners mm -hmm. uh, really pushing for climate mm -hmm. change uh, work, more additional work to be done across the city was, was very impressive. And PCAR was uh, a part of that. So those franchise fees that I mentioned were a part of that as well. Uh, and so pollution control annual registrations were looked at as a tool. It's a very different tool. I'm, I know that you've had conversations uh, with folks here in the, in the legal department and just talking about the difference between the fees, uh, franchise fee and PCAR fees. Uh, and so there was a, there's a group that we've worked with for a number of years, Elevate. Um, and um, yeah, so that was one of the contractors. I don't know if, if contracting or staff capacity was as much as of a challenge as, as bringing all of the franchise fee and everything that was going on last year, our climate equity plan, all together at the same time. And I think staff probably had frustrations with that as well, uh, with the process and, and, and everything that went on there. So, um, but yeah, so this was always a tool that was part of it, and I think it's a really innovative approach. And so thank you for bringing this legislative directive forward to uh, probe into more questions on this and how we can create a program that really, to me, and I think to staff, uh, creates fairness uh, when we look at uh, climate change pollution, is making sure that we're tracking all the sources of pollution and so we don't have folks that are, some folks that are paying it and some folks that aren't. And just to follow up on the piece, you mentioned Elevate was one of the contractors. Which uh, component, there was four components of the legislative directive, were they uh, involved in kind of shaping, again, that scope of work? Where did they support? Yeah, so uh, the Elevate, the conversations we had with them was looking at broadly at, at these different strategies of franchise fee and, and PCAR. I don't know if they were specifically delved into the intricacies of PCAR the way that we're looking at them right now. Staff spent much more time looking at that. In fact, Jenny Lansing... Uh, who's not here today, and, and Tom Frame, our engineer, uh, spent much of the time and are still spending time on that list that I uh, just showed you previously. Uh, going back and forth with the MPCA, there are some pieces. I highlighted one piece where it says heat, uh, and there's different sources of heat that the MPCA has registered, and so that, that needs to be clarified. But there's a lot of uh, digging through the haystack to, to make sense of, of the data that's out there and make sure that we're doing it fairly. Great. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that we have this information, which it did definitely clarify, you know, uh, what is within our legal grounds and what is not uh, when it comes to um, our current fee schedule. Um, the next steps are also very clear, I think, from this legislative directive that we're currently not recouping the cost of CO2 uh, mitigation and that we do have legal grounds to proceed with that one. So as you highlighted, um, Committee members, you do have a legislative motion in front of you um, directing the legislative department to evaluate the cost of a CO2 PCAR program so that we can calculate the fee level that is appropriate within our municipal fee authority. Um, I also want to name my office has already spoke uh, spoken to organizations who are ready to support the legislative department if necessary, and I'm eager to see if they will help us uh, expand PCAR fees for 2025. Um, I think all of us recognize just like the imperative and urgent nature of this work. It's 49 degrees outside, um, and it's January, which is ridiculous, um, and <laughs> residents constantly uh, tell, I think all of us, I know my office for certain, that Climate change is a huge priority for them, um, and they want to see the city taking bold action to respond to the climate emergency that we're currently in. So by advancing the recommendation that's provided in this report, I'm, I'm fairly confident that we can uh, implement a PCAR fee for CO2 starting in 2025, and passing this legislative directive is the first step to make it happen. So with that, hmm? after there's still this question. Okay. Um, I it, it seems like we have some other folks in queue. I will hold off on introducing yeah. my motion until we're done with discussion. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Council President Payne. Thank you, Chair Chavez. I was just wondering if you could give a little bit more context to the cost of mitigation in our expense ratio, because it seems to me just like from a math perspective that would you could increase the denominator of that and get your ratio to any number that would facilitate an increased fee. So what are the qualifications to be included in the expense or the cost of mitigation factor. Sure. Chair Chavez, Council President Payne. Um, yeah, so we looked at the cost of mitigation and the, yeah, there, there's some truth to what you're saying is that uh, we really wanted to look at what the costs of 
uh, per project that we had in terms of reducing specific pollutants um, and and then applying that cost. Um, well, it, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the charts that are given to you in this are for the, co the total cost of mitigation. So what we're doing right now is evaluating cost of mitigation. If you were to create a program moving forward, what would the costs of, of increasing that mitigation and, uh, and looking at those 28,000 tons and then looking at those specific users and so how would you apply what our historical cost of mitigation was and applying it to this, this whole set. And so that's what we're trying to um, weigh out right now and that'll be part of what we bring forward if this passes. Well, actually, if, if that'll be what we bring forward. Yeah. Uh, so then, to, just to clarify, would the constraint on the cost of mitigation be defined by what we're enforcing against and what you would need to mitigate to get to the level that's been licensed at for the peak car fee? Yeah, so there's, t there's two. So the Chair Chavez, sorry. Chair Chavez, Council President Payne. Um, the cost of there's the cost of enforcement, so cost of going out and doing inspections, cost of administration. That's a separate cost than the cost of mitigation, and the cost of mitigation is related to what we would apply uh, to get a certain tonnage of, of pollution. Um, and so those are the enforcement piece and the mitigation pieces are separate costs that we're factoring into whatever this fee would be. Does, does that answer the question? Sorry. Yeah, I think we can follow up all offline, okay, too, because it, it does get kind of technical at that point, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, I'll direct the clerk to receive and file that report. I will call the Vice Chair Wansi, who will make a motion. Thank you. As I mentioned, um, there's a legislative motion to follow up on the CO2 uh, PCAR uh, fee. So with that, I will ask for a second. Second. Thank you. And yeah, we'll move for approval. Thank you, Vice Chair Wansley. Is there a discussion on this item? Seeing no further discussion, I'll ask the clerk to take the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Rainville. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Paul Masano. Aye. Vice Chair Wansley. Aye. Chair Chavez. Aye. There are six ayes. Thank you. The next item is re receiving and filing an update on the response to the Community Safety Center Third Precinct Facility Legislative Directive. Here to present on this item is Community Safety Commissioner Barnett. Here we go. There, it's on now. Um, again, good afternoon, Chair uh, Chavez, Vice Chair Wansley, Council President Payne, Vice President uh, Chuck Tai, and other council members. I'm Todd Barnett, the Commissioner of Community Safety. I'm here today to give you an update on Vice Chair Wansley's uh, legislative directive. Um, Related to that, I think it's important that I give you a quick update on the property at 2633 Minnehaha Avenue. Um, as you know, uh, this council approved the purchase of 2633 Minnehaha on November 2nd. Um, this will be the location for a community safety center uh, and also a police station. You might hear, refer, hear me refer to it as the South Minneapolis Community Safety Center. On January 1st of uh, this year, uh, funds became available for this property. And last week, a uh, purchase agreement was signed for the property and earnest money was deposited. Uh, we're at the stage now that uh, there's a 90-day due diligence that's going to happen. Uh, and what that means is that a property service folks will perform uh, property inspections, environmental testing to do due, due diligence. Uh, the end of the due diligence is April 15th. Um, it could happen earlier uh, if everything checks out, but that's um, our due date. Also, we're projecting that the closing date for this property will be on or about June 1st. 
Our goal uh, is to open the South Minneapolis Community Safety Center by Q1 of 2025. That's our goal. Uh, hopefully uh, it will happen sooner. But to get to um, the uh, legislative director directive by Vice Chair Wansley, there were um, three parts to that. Uh, the first part and I'll just read it real quickly here, was a comprehensive, comprehensive overview of how the proposed community safety center and service delivery model will contribute to the implementation of the safe and thriving community, community service continuum model. Um, what I can tell you is that the design and implement, implementation team uh, you might have heard me talk about this before, but the design and implementation team is uh, co-chaired by one of our staff members from the Office of Community Safety and one staff member from the Office of Public Service. And so we were able uh, to convene this committee at the end of November. And we did that um, right after being able to get this group right after the purchase of our property at 2633 Minnehaha. And we wanted to get started um, early, even though at that time I didn't have a director of design implementation. That director, I think as most of you know uh, by now is Amanda Harrington, and she came on in early December. As recommended in the Safe and Thriving Community Report, written by Dr. Oftely, um, the design implementation team has been working to create a, a, a collaborative practice model. They're drafting the mission, vision, and values of the design implementation work and instituting uh, management structures to implement the vision. The overarching vision that's being drafted is to ensure services related to the preventive responsive and restorative services from the report uh, are included in the Community Safety Center. The design and implementation team also began uh, gathering data uh, for an asset and gap analysis, which was also recommended by the Safe and Thriving Community Report. Our South Minneapolis Community Safety C C Center um, will work as a model hopefully for the rest of the city as we move forward. Moving to, uh, I would say, the second part or component two of the legislative uh, directive is a list of specific community safety functions and breakdowns of specific programs to be co-located with MPD third precinct. It's too early at this point to answer this question. Um, like I said earlier, we have the formation of the design implementation team. They have further work to do, uh, and I'll talk more about uh, that work as I move to uh, the third component of the directive. The third component of the directive is information about the proposed development of the community safety center, including details about the city's work plan and associated timeline in which city, in which city uh, departments are engaged in the work. So Director uh, Amanda Harrington is working with leaders across the city on building out the community safety ecosystem. The South Minneapolis Community Safety Center is part of the work of this design and implementation team. Uh, the team, like I said earlier, is co-chaired by the Office of Community Safety and that's Director Amanda Harrington and the public uh, service uh, as well has a, has a co-chair. The departments that are involved are all five departments of the Office of Community Safety, so 911, police, fire, emergency management, and neighborhood safety. And then from our Office of Public Service, we have community planning and economic development, finance and property services, health, information technology, neighborhood and community relations, racial equity, inclusion, and belonging, uh, and regulatory services. Also part of this team, of course, is the city attorney's office. 
At this point, the team has met at the end of November, um, and now they're starting to break into their subgroups. And those smaller work groups or subgroups will start to meet the first week of February. And they will focus in three areas, the conceptual service and resources, community engagement and communication, and then the third one being infrastructure. So the focus on these work group and the proposed timelines for you, the conceptual service and resources uh, for the design, and, uh, design of the community safety center concept we plan to have by the end of Q1. Uh, utilizing uh, community engagement information and city data to determine which services or partners will be housing uh, the South Minneapolis Community Safety Center. That should be done hopefully by the end of Q2 or sometime in Q3. When we talk about the subgroup for community engagement and communications, uh, that communication has, that has already started to progress. Uh, I believe uh, today we've um, started a website uh, and all those things should hopefully be uh, completed by the end of Q1. We want to review existing input from the community. We know that there's been a lot of work uh, around the Community Safety Center. Uh, I learned that the last time I was here when council members said that there's already been some community engagement. So um, Director Man Harrington uh, and other uh, committee members or team members are starting to gather that information, not just what the city has done, but what other organizations has done and looking at that methodology as well. We wanna create a community engagement plan and complete that community engagement plan by the end of Q2 or beginning of Q3. That third uh, group that's looking at infrastructure, uh, as you know, as we move along, uh, we'll need to uh, also look at um, planning related to future uh, safety communication centers like what we have at the first precinct. Uh, that's something like that we would like to see um, in other precincts as well and think that we can uh, start that process uh, at the property at, at 2633 uh, Minnehaha Avenue. The physical design of the place, uh, that's something that we're hoping to complete somewhere in Q2 and Q3. I stand for questions. Thank you, Commissioner Burnett. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Vice Chair Wansley. Thank you, Chair Chavez. A uh, couple comments and also questions. So uh, just a little bit more context because it's been a few months since we've taken up this item in committee. Um, but as you iterated back in October 2023, the mayor asked council to vote uh, to approve the purchase of 2633 Minnehaha Ave um, to turn it into originally just a third precinct. Um, and that eventually transitioned into not only a third precinct after community pushback, but into a community safety center. Um, and during those discussions, it became very clear um, that once again, the administration had no plan uh, for this building outside of the status quo of a police precinct. Um, that was also confirmed by Mayor Fry's own community safety center memo that's also in LIMS on page four, uh, where it emphasizes funding for the law enforcement component of the center and nothing additional for the unspecified community safety functions and services, also known as the comprehensive components. Um, council members, as well as residents, were justifiably concerned about what appeared to be the administration's intention to move the police back um, into a building without investing in the safe and thriving communities uh, model. So this led council to pass a resolution to express a commitment to include both the comprehensive safety functions as well as the third precinct functions and to also involve a community in the further development of that center. Uh, the resolution also expresses a commitment to host a ceremonial grand opening of both the community safety center and the third precinct center, both on the same day at the same time. Um, in addition to that resolution, I brought forward this legislative directive to exercise council's oversight authority to ensure that we're making progress towards the commitments expressed in that resolution. Um, Cause I wanna make sure, you know, that this multi-million dollar purchase 
actually had a fully baked plan uh, behind it. Uh, and today we're receiving the first update on that legislative directive about the status of that plan. And what I'm hearing so far is there's lots of staff meetings or subgroups that's being comprised to make a plan, but they're still not a plan. Uh, meaning we are still about 0% away from fulfilling the commitments outlined in that resolution that council passed last December. And that is concerning since there is a number of outstanding uh, serious questions about you somewhat named of like engagement with the community that's gonna happen later in the year, how we're gonna build out that continuum of service around like the preventative, responsiveness, and restorative pillars that's outlined in the Dr. Offtelly report. And also most importantly, how are these programs um, going to coexist with MPD given their current behaviors of them not fully in compliance with the consent decree, all sorts of stuff that's happening. Um, and of course, how much does all this cost before we walk into the next budget uh, session? So, you know, I, I it's, it's lots of things that still needs to be flushed out. And as you mentioned, you know, we received the email where um, council sh is expected to sign off on a purchase agreement uh, in June. And with that only being five months away, I know my constituents want to see details, not later in 2025, but definitely immediately within a five minute five month span. Um, they want to know what services are going to be provided in this building to the community. And they want to make sure that this building is going to be utilized to advance that comprehensive safety component um, that still isn't flushed out. So with that question time, can you confirm um, if the timeline that we're on, um, essentially, we're not going to have a full plan in place for all these components by June, like the completion date? When you say full plan, are you talking about knowing exactly mm -hmm. what services are in um, the building besides the precinct? Yes. Vice Chair, um, well, I'm sorry, Chair uh, Chavez, Council President uh, Payne, and Vice Chair Wansley. Uh, that is something, um, Vice Chair Wansley, that we're pushing to try to get done um, by the end of Q2. Um, I. The, the one thing that I would say is that um, I know from being here previously that one of the things that was clear, and, and you, you mentioned it in the resolution and other things, was that this building was to open with both. Uh, one of the things that I found um, also informative and where I think I aligned with council was that we, as we move forward, um, although we might have some type of restrictions on exactly what can go into the building, um, uh, just because it's adjacent to a precinct or maybe the type of services, but my point is that it was also made clear that the community um, had to have input into that. Uh, and so when we look at what we're trying to do is we know that there's a lot of information um, when that we should have when we go to engage the community. Um, we don't want to ask the same questions over again that's already been asked. We want to be very mindful of the questions that we ask. We want to be mindful of any groups that we might have missed. Uh, and I, I thought it was very clear um, from some concerns that maybe what we've done in the past as engaging the community was not sufficient. So we, we want to be mindful um, here as we move along. And that's why we have so many other departments. Uh, I know there's a need to move fast, uh, but we want, to, we want to get it right. And we want to get it right for you. We want to get it right for the citizens of Minneapolis. So just to make sure I'm recapping this, yep. again, I, I heard plans around engagement. That's going to, you know, you don't want to be duplicative in that intentional. But essentially, we will not have uh, uh, understanding of what services are going into that building, how that aligns with the continuum of services or that, those four pillars in the Safe and Thriving Communities Report. That will not happen by June where that is the completion date per your email for, like, closing on this building. That is true. Okay. But 
from hearing from you. We can try to work as hard as we can to speed it up. And then on that with the design team, um, I hear or heard a lot around like staff, staff, staff. From my understanding, none of the third precinct boundary council members have been involved or asked to be involved in that process. Um, how are you looking to input or solicit input from council members, especially those within those boundaries, um, in that process before the June closing date? Yeah, you know, um, I'm sure that that subgroup who's working on this uh, will engage uh, beyond, of course, our employees. We know we know that we need to do that work. And what does that look like? I, I really can't tell you right now because that subgroup, like I said, will meet uh, the first week of February. Okay. So, again, just want to name the concerns. I thank you for yep. being open to expedite things, but knowing five months away, time goes really fast. The fact that there still isn't a plan, there still isn't a plan to engage council members serving the third precinct around this. Um, community members won't know what's going into the building once it's closed. And also, again, if the goal that was outlined in the resolution is to do an opening of both, that doesn't feel like we're going to be prepared to do that both or do the both and. Right now, it seems like we know what the police is, not that broader comprehensive side that the community asked for um, in addition. So that piece is concerning that Will we have that flushed out and a fully plan to communicate to the public in the next four and a half months? Sorry, uh, I keep forgetting as I'm answering the questions to say, uh, Chair Chavez, Council President uh, Payne, and Vice uh, Chair uh, Wansley. Uh, I think it's important that uh, as we move along that um, it's, instead of just thinking of it as being fast, that we think of us trying to do the things that um, the council have asked. What was very clear, Vice Chair Wansley, the last time I was here and talking about this from several council members, uh, if it wasn't explicitly said, um, I definitely got the message clear that this council wanted this building to open with both sides simultaneously, not one before the other, and definitely not the precinct before the community safety center. That message was well received by me. Well, we'll see how this plan goes, but I see other people in queue, so that wraps my commentary up. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Burnett. Uh, Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Barnett, I'm just curious. You mentioned, and I'll paraphrase, three smallish work group subcommittees, and I'm just curious if you could give us an idea of what that composition will be. Are you envisioning um, community stakeholders? Are you envisioning council members as part of these work groups? Both. Can you just give us a little bit more about what you're thinking in that? You know, um, I would actually have to get back to you on exactly what that is. Uh, I have all the confidence in Director Amanda Harrington in the work that they've done. Um, I just don't have the answer for you, uh, and there might be one, but I can definitely get that answer for you. Sure, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Councilmember Palmasano. I'd also probably send that to the council, and specifically third yes. person council members, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Councilmember Rainbow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Commissioner, I just want to thank you so much for bringing your life experience and your wisdom and your calm demeanor to our city. I, I think you're doing a great job. I think uh, Director Harrington is doing an excellent job. And these months will pass quickly. And you're so smart to take your time and do this the right way the first time and not have to, to backslide on issues that you didn't think of at a time. So I have complete confidence in you. I think you're doing a great job. Your staff is doing a great job. Thank you for coming today and giving this update. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Barnett. We look forward to future updates, and right. we look forward to the email uh, with more answers on that. But thank you for being here yes. today. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you.
The next item is the receiving and filing of an update from the city on Camp Nanokasi. Here to present an item is City Operations Officer Margaret Anderson Kelleher and the Community Safety Commissioner Barnett. Good afternoon. We'll just do some slides here for you. Here, it's the first time I've presented, I think, in this room, so. Thank you, and if we can have the clerks put this online, I don't think this was sent to us ahead of time. I don't believe yeah. it was either. So I just wanna make sure I'm gonna click in the right direction here. The operations officer, if you can make sure that our clerks get Great. this presentation, sure I wasn't aware that there was gonna be a presentation ahead of time. your cool system you had in the other chamber. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you, Chair Chavez and committee members, Council President Payne, Vice Chair Wansley. Uh, I wanna first acknowledge a number of leaders of the city and the county who are in the room today who may assist in the presentation. Uh, most certainly, Commissioner Barnett will be assisting in the presentation, and I wanna thank him. Regulatory Services Director Enrique Valdez is here. CPED Director Eric Hansen is with us. The Health Commissioner, Damone Chaplin, I don't believe is in the room, but his team has been assisting. MPD Chief Brian O'Hara, Fire Chief Brian Tyner as well uh, for his work with encampments and particularly the, these two encampments. And then uh, finally, Hennepin County Director of Housing Stability, David Hewitt is with us today. And David is not part of our formal presentation. However, if there are continuum of care questions or questions around providers, David uh, is willing to come and help fill those questions for us. So I wanna start uh, by just grounding us in the city's pillars to prevent homelessness and end homelessness. And those include deep partnership with Hennepin County on the continuum of care. And specifically, I wanna point out that 90 new beds have gone online in shelter and we certainly can talk about shelter, that shelter is not uh, ideal, but shelter is part of the continuum of care to helping people move into stable housing. Affordable housing and homelessness. Uh, this council, previous councils, uh, have since the pandemic invested $200 million in the city of Minneapolis with partners in affordable housing, and that does make a difference. I also want to uh, name that opioid response has been increased in the city, particularly with the contract with Helix Health, which I know was unprecedented for the city of Minneapolis to uh, have that contract in effect. And that contract alone has helped 96 people find housing, mental health support, and addiction services. We have some key principles that we use in our encampment response guidelines. Everyone who's experiencing unsheltered homelessness is vulnerable and deserves dignified and respectful treatment and housing and their rights. Every effort has to be made to connect people to housing, shelter, and services. Encampments are a serious public health risk to safety, including and centering on people staying in the encampment itself. They are not a dignified form of shelter. So when looking at encampments around the city and working with encampment residents, there are four key concerns that are evaluated every single time. Neighborhood impact being one of those 
elements, size of encampment, proximity to schools, residences, businesses, daycares, air quality around the encampment. The health impact, hygiene, as well as presence of minors or people who are pregnant. Disease outbreak. The next piece is safety impact. Weather conditions, as well as the, uh, what we see in the winter, particularly with fires, propane uh, tanks, drug use, as well as violence. And finally, external impact, and that is imminent development on a particular site, which we had in the case uh, of both of these encampment sites. So I'm going to go through a timeline. I'll try not to read it verbatim, but I want you to have it, and I certainly want to have it in the LIMS file for everyone. So this, the first encampment uh, really established because MnDOT, my former employer, closed the Wall of Forgotten Natives encampment in August of 2023. Individuals broke into a fenced city lot at 13th and 23rd Street, forming a new encampment. This lot is the site of the future Indigenous Peoples Task Force Community Center. From August 2023 till January of 2024, the City Homeless Response Team, Hennepin County, other service providers visited this new encampment regularly to provide information about shelter, housing services, addiction services, storage services, transportation, as well as resources. October through January, city staff engaged directly with camp organizers to discuss the needs of individuals and a plan for closure. November 23 to January of 24, the city entered into the contract I mentioned earlier with Helix Health and housing services to provide housing, mental health, and substance treatment in collaboration with Red Lake Nation. Through those efforts, 96 residents at the encampment were connected to housing and wraparound services through Helix. Another 34 residents were connected to similar services via Hennepin County, who is our partner on this work. Through the city-county partnership in November, warming centers were established as we went into the colder months for being able to have a safe environment for folks. In uh, November of 2023, leaders communicated from the Metropolitan Urban Indian Directors Group, MUD, that they demanded the immediate closure of the encampment. We all worked together to identify a closure date, and that was December 14th for the first closure, which was extended to December 19th to allow additional time to access services and housing. In December 2023 as well, city leaders, including many council members, as well as legislators, a county commissioner, service providers, encampment leaders met at a community meeting and extended the closure date further out. The request was made for the city to really explore, and I would say interrogate the idea of whether we could find a way to move the encampment to 24 seven shelter indoors. And that was not successful. And the major reason why not successful, every single service provider told us that on the timeline that Ninakasi 1 needed to move off the site for the closure and the due diligence by Indigenous Peoples Task Force, we could, they could not meet that timeline. And therefore, the, that was communicated back that it was not possible to do the 24-7 indoor, indoor uh, shelter. January 2024, with help from Hennepin County, the state of Minnesota, Rescue Now, more than 90 more beds went online in the first week in January. 
Then in January, uh, January 4th and 5th of this year, the city conducted a closure of the encampment. Community Planning and Economic Development notified organizers of the closure. The Minneapolis Health Department provided the needle pickup. The Department of Regulatory Services provided information on transportation, shelter, storage, and other services available. Public Works cleaned and secured the site. Minneapolis Police Department supported to ensure that both homeless individuals, community members, and city staff were safe throughout the closure. In January 24, uh, right upon the heels of this, some individuals moved into and broke into a city lot at 14th and 26th Street prior to and during the closure of the first camp. They removed a no trespassing sign that was present and set up a new encampment. This site is the site of a city funded, future site of a city funded affordable housing development. Again, uh, the city immediately posted on January 4th and again on January 8th, communicated that with camp organizers multiple times that a closure would be impending soon. We did place at this site, as we had at the other site, porta potties and provided trash service. That is an important, oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. So porta potties were put on site to be able to both help residents of the encampment and the surrounding area. January 24, the city's homeless response team visits the new encampment six times to provide information for shelter, housing, addiction services, storage, again, that is free, transportation, and other resources. In January, city leaders met with encampment organizers in person, online, and communicated in writing the desire and will to find land for a permanent healing center slash treatment center that would be organized and run by Red Lake Nation. I'm going to turn this over to Commissioner Barnett to go through the public safety side of things. Okay. Again, good afternoon, Chair Chavez, uh, Vice Chair Wansley, Council President Payne, and Vice uh, President Chuck Tai. I'll just go quickly here um, and hit the highlights for our public health and safety timeline. You can see, and I combine from August. Um, of 2023 to uh, January of 2024 um, that we had over 100 911 calls associated with both locations. Um, and as you know, uh, some of those reports had to do with assaults, gunshot uh, injuries, uh, vandalism, property damage, drug overdose, and fires. As we all know, and it was reported in October, that a newborn baby had died in the encampment and also at the same uh, month we had a drug overdose that occurred there and an individual died. December, man was killed at the encampment um, and then in January, when you look at the reports at the uh, encampment that was closed yesterday and you look at uh, the complaints from there to 311, the mayor's office and some of our city departments, we've had over 100 complaints. Those complaints uh, were concerns about fire, air quality, sanitation, and uh, criminal activity. As has been reported, and you know uh, that this month, uh, there was a stomach virus outbreak in which the health department had to respond to 
um, and gave recommendations in which the city helped implement. And on January 28th, um, we had a report of individuals shot outside of the encampment. Um, the person who was the shooter, the uh, preliminary reports is that that shooter came from the encampment. Luckily, the individual that was shot, it was non-threatening. They went to the hospital. Um, so uh, when we look at um, the encampment closure, um, as uh, the CEO has already uh, said to you, you know, we provided assistance uh, when responding. Uh, we might have announced that there was a 90 minute time frame, uh, but as uh, people ask for uh, other folks to come help them, uh, we extended that time frame. We let volunteers come in to help clean up the site and help people remove their belongings. Uh, as you know, the resources that were used was the homelessness uh, response team, and they provided water, food, non-can, and socks. Um, and so some of, those are some of the things. We had transportation available to Catholic charities and other shelter locations. Um, as you know, the site um, should have been completed today. I didn't check on it being cleaned up by our uh, public work staff, but we had 22 works there. Uh, we had a large kitchen tent, and there was over 50 propane tanks and a large amount of firewood that, of course, concerns us um, when you're in a residential neighborhood. Of course, as we know, um, just today, uh, there's been um, another new encampment site. Uh, that site um, also had fencing around it, in which people cut the fencing. Um, this location is between two residential uh, houses. We've already posted the no trespass signs um, there. And the city is also uh, posting an order to evict sometime today, and that that campsite or encampment uh, will also be looked at at being closed very soon. Mr. Chavez and committee members, our next step includes continuing to work with leaders of Red Lake Nation to identify and hopefully bring before you a land transfer soon so that a permanent healing center, treatment center can be established, a low barrier one. As well as we need to continue to do our work as a city per our ordinances to have continuous and coordinated efforts to deter encampments within the city, but also provide services in our partnership especially with Hennepin County, who I want to thank. This is not in any way a county versus city issue. It is imperative that we are working together and that we are working with our partners at the state of Minnesota. That concludes the presentation. Happy to take questions. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I want to thank you for the time that you have given the committee. Uh, before I ask a variety of questions I have, and I want to bring up the realities of the situation and the ongoing issues that we have ahead of us. Without the help of the organizers at Captain Akasi, these numbers of people getting housed would have never happened. A centralized location and the help of a cultural component helped our city staff and our partners house people. And I think that's important to mention. I've had various conversations with Vivo, and they've told me numerous times that they are committed to whatever sheltering location is devised, we have community members that are willing to help us on an indoor location, like I've mentioned multiple times. My colleagues and I do not think encampments are suitable for everyone, but if we continue with our current approach, we will only make this issue worse. Our community faces conditions that are a direct result of systemic ongoing disregard for residents of Phillips. Whether it's environmental pollution, community safety, which many of the neighbors by encampments have consistently talked about, or pushing people that are vulnerable around, these harms impact housed and out-housed residents alike, often pitting them once 
against each other. And I think that's not something we're supposed to be doing in the city of Minneapolis. We're supposed to be ish addressing these issues firsthand. These issues fall upon the least resourced neighborhoods, which is Ward 9 is one of them, with the most ignored and silenced residents across the city. We must be responsive to these concerns in a way that serves all residents rather than dividing them. Meaningful investments in the community must increase the livability of all residents, both housed and unhoused. And I want to let my residents know that my office is committed to doing that, which is why we've introduced three ordinances just last week, and they're being referred to committee next week. And my office is still going to be pushing our city, our county, and state on establishing that South Minneapolis of the Old Village, which we desperately need in South Minneapolis. These encampments continue to be moved from block to block without solutions in plain sight. Unhoused neighbors are being fo forced to roam the streets. Residents in the area are feeling very unsafe along with their children. And I, I know you mentioned the timeline here, but I want to repeat it for the public. On August 24th, there was an encampment evicted at the Wall of Forgotten Natives behind the East Phillips Park. And then it moved to the 2300 block of 13th Avenue South, where Camp Renacasi was formed and was later evicted on January 4th, and then relocated three blocks away at the 2600 block of 14th Avenue South. Camp Renacasi was evicted again yesterday and is now blocks away at the 2300 block of 16th Avenue South. All over Phillips, actually. This is just bouncing around the problem. It's not actually doing anything to solve the, the issue here. Unhoused residents and residents in the area are rightfully frustrated about our ineffective approach. Both groups would agree that moving people indoors to a healing center would be the best option, not long term, but right now, which is something that my office is continue, going to continue to push. We, don't, we, we can talk about long term visions, but we just kicked 100 people out yesterday and forced them down a couple blocks down. And that doesn't help both our housed neighbors who are struggling with public safety and our unhoused neighbors who are struggling as well. I have received over 250 constituent calls, emails, and contacts about this encampment, 94% of whom have asked my office to support Camp Renokasi and to use all my tools at my disposal to protect residents who are unhoused, who are being treated undignified. They understand that our approach isn't working. But you know who also, doesn't, who also understands that our approach isn't working? the other folks in my neighborhoods who also don't feel safe and whose voices matter when their public safety concerns aren't being addressed. They want safety for their families, for their children, and they want mental health and housing for every single resident in the city of Minneapolis. And both these can be true at once. It's a reminder that the Ninth Ward continues to be one of the most disinvested areas in the entire city of Minneapolis, a community that is oftentimes forgotten and left behind by our city government. I have a variety of questions because these are questions that a lot of community members, both housed and unhoused, actually want answers to, and I'm going to uh, read them out loud right now. Community members at Camp Nakasi and neighbors in the area have been very clear for the need of public safety at the encampment. They called 911 and asked for help removing an individual who was noted to be a source of conflict for the past weeks and who was armed. Can you give me a status update on why this individual was not removed? and then later shot somebody, which was one of the reasons this encampment was evicted, according to the city. Chair uh, Chavez, uh, Council President Payne, and other uh, council members, I would have to get back with an update for you on that. Um, I don't have that information handy for you. Thank you. Uh, I also want to note for the public record that I'm bringing forth a related item to the Committee of Hull on Tuesday which we'll be hearing from Camp Nakasi community partners about their work on the ground to support our unhoused neighbors. I'm mentioning this to staff right now because if I don't get answers to the questions, if, if my colleagues don't get answers to those questions, I'm gonna send an email. I hope to get a response and I'll be reading out loud the answers to these questions to the body because I wanna make sure that the public hears the answers to these questions. I think both housed and unhoused neighbors want to know why they, were, they reported that somebody had a gun, they didn't get the police didn't do anything, and then someone got shot. I think both, both neighbors, both sides of neighbors want to hear that answer. I have question number two. Based on the city's response and operational guidelines, an initial notice of trespass, notice to vacate, and a notice of closure date shall be posted by the city at least 72 hours prior to closure. Can you please let me know when this was first posted in person? So, Mr. Chair and committee members, the operational order 
of how this is handled is number one, the city ordinance 244.6 is the basis for all trespassing in the city of Minneapolis. And certainly the city attorney's office could help on the understanding of that, but my understanding of it is that is the basis for everything. Two, camp, the second camp location was signed immediately for closure. And three, third point, there were many one-on-one -on -one conversations about impending camp closure. There are times when camp closures happen that an exact date is not posted, and there are some clear guidelines around that. Those clear guidelines include safety of the residents. You just mentioned a particular safety situation with gun violence. Violence and health and safety at the encampment. You heard us go through the timeline that with the GI outbreak, any encampment closure was halted, delayed, because that is the best practice. And then the next piece is the safety of employees as well. And those are the cases where a specific date is not posted. But this encampment was posted continuously. I understand that there's a city ordinance in, in, in place. I am referring, and I'll repeat the question again. Based on the city's operational guidelines, an initial notice of trespass, notice to vacate, and notice of closure date shall be posted by the city at least 72 hours prior to closure. I understand that by reading the operational guidance, if there's concerns of public safety, that you may bypass that as a decision from the city. I'm not asking that question. What I'm asking, what date was it posted at the encampment? From my understanding, there was no in-person date to vacate to the encampment. Another instance that we talked about this, Director Anderson Kelleher, there was someone that came, and a pastor that came and dropped off a vacate sign at the encampment that was not a city employee with incorrect dates. I'm assuming that's just an individual that decided to do that on their own, one, so I'm not counting that as a notice. I am asking when and the date and time was there an in-person sign to vacate? And if there wasn't, why was that not followed? So, because there was multiple times before the public safety concerns arise to do that. So Mr. Chair, from the day this encampment was established, there was posting of a notice of trespass and notice to vacate. A specific date was not given per our guidelines because of public safety concerns at this site, safety for employees, safety for residents. Thank you. I, if you can follow up with me on the exact date of when that was posted, I want to make sure that if it is the pastor that dropped off that sign, if it is that person, I want to know why there is a pro if, what's the protocol to have non-city staff drop off these things. So, Mr. Chair, I know the story of that. I investigated that story because it was brought to my attention right away. We have a contractor who posts these signs. That contractor had gone the very first day and posted the second day they felt unsafe, they ask a friend to go along with them. That friend has said, Pastor, we have since in regulatory services, because they hold that contract, have informed that contractor that friends are not allowed to go along. If there's a need for public safety, then they should be working with the city for someone to go along with them, whether that is MPD, that could be traffic control. There are a number of people available in the city who could go along with the contractor, but that was not protocol. Thank you, and you could see why that's very confusing to the people at the encampment. Non-city staff dropping off signs with wrong dates and information. I hope that can never happen again. Um, I'll go to question number three. Based on the city's operational guideline, it is the city's goal to offer storage options at least once during the 72-hour window. Once during the 72-hour window. Did the city provide storage during this time window? I will assume because it was a public safety concern, you did not have to follow that protocol. But my concern is, was there storage of personal belonging resources available the day of the eviction? Yep. 
Mr. Chair, I'm looking to see if someone else wants to come up who was on the ground. I believe, my understanding, is that storage services were offered yesterday. Chavez, committee members? Mic, Certainly. Uh, so the question is of uh, storage options offered on the date. Enrique Velasquez, Director of Regulatory Services. Uh, so the question is of what storage options are offered on the day of an encampment closure? No, I'll repeat the question. I was, I was asking, there's an operational guideline that the city has posted online that I reviewed thoroughly last night in preparation for this meeting. It tells us that you will, in 72 hours, that time window, you'll provide storage. I'm assuming that you're gonna disregard that because there was a public safety concern, so you don't need to follow that guideline is what I'm expecting to get an answer out of. But there was an eviction that was a prize eviction yesterday. I wanna know if the city provided storage of personal belongings. And the reason I ask that is because we had people scrambling across our city with their belongings without a place to put them in. Yes, so with each of the different visits that we had made up until that point, we did offer storage solutions, and to my knowledge, nobody took us up on those, those options uh, to uh, utilize or make avail available the storage of uh, the downtown improvement district. Uh, we did not offer storage within 72 hours of the date of that specific closure. And including the date of, there was no storage provided, correct? Yes, that's correct. Again the reason we're working on encampment response policy is because people do not have a place to store their things. Thank you. Question number four. We received an update. You, uh, CEO Anderson Keller, I really appreciate it. You, you're talking about working with the Red Lake Nation. Can you please let us know what the addresses of those locations are? Mr. Chair, I don't have them off the top of my head. We're going to have to get those for you. We have cool. at least two sites identified. Great. I would appreciate an email. Thank you. Question number five, on the city's response to homelessness website, it mentions the American Indian Community Development Corporation and Avivo as partners. Can you let me know if they were informed about the eviction ahead of time? I have the answer for you, but, but I, would love to, I would love to know from staff's perspective. <laughs> Chair Chavez, community members, Enrique Velasquez, Director of Regulatory Services again. Uh, so in advance of the encampment closure, we did not provide advance notice to uh, our partners, community partners. Thank you. That's what I thought. Uh, I also heard from MUD, the Metropolitan Urban Indigenous Directors, that they were not informed about this eviction. And LEAD, to let everyone advance with dignity, who actually has clients at the encampment, they were also not informed about this eviction. Question number six, the Director Anderson Kelleher, CEO Anderson Kelleher, the media reported that you said there were only 25 people at the encampment. We got an email update from you yesterday that it perhaps is 25 to 50 people. Can you help me understand the change in numbers mm -hmm. and why that's being reported by the media? I hope the media is very careful and also and confirming those numbers as well moving forward because I heard from people that actually live there that it's closer to 100. Mr. Chair, yesterday at a press conference about the closure, I stated we had preliminary numbers. At that point, what I stated is three people had left the encampment who identified themselves as unhoused residents of the encampment. That was about at 11 a.m. At that point, we believed the number was under 25. When the two points of entrance and exit were opened so that there were no points of entrance and exit, it was very difficult for staff on the ground to be able to estimate the number. That is where you're getting to 20 to 50. Our homeless response team repeatedly with the county told us that they believed somewhere around 25 people were staying at the camp overnight in the three weeks that it was in existence. So it is a difficult thing, I will acknowledge. Yeah, I, I would just be careful with naming specific numbers when the camp has a by list name of people and how many people they have. And people that actually slip, sleep there should know how many people are there. So I wanted to reiterate that, and I hope the media um, understands what I'm saying when numbers are being thrown out there. Mr. Chair, I want to be very clear. I, told, I did say those were preliminary numbers yesterday. Thank you. Uh, question number seven. 
yesterday you stated, uh, CEO Anderson Keller heard that there were 80 to 90 beds available in the entire month of January. Can you please let me know where you are getting this data? Mm -hmm. And can you let me know if you're aware of the weekly shelter reports from Hennepin County? So Mr. Chair, there were 80 to 90 beds available most mornings in January through the Hennepin County system. We received those numbers from the Hennepin County dashboard. Mm -hmm. At night, and this has been clarified staff to staff today, somewhere around 20 in beds have been available every night. <laughs> so from 90 to 20. There was a miscommunication I know, that's between what I'm asking. the two staffs. I agree. And, and the reason I was asking if you know about that weekly report from the county is because I know those numbers are inaccurate. And I think it's important that we're being accurate when we're reporting these numbers because now people think there's actually 90 beds available when it's not the case. And I hope people heard that. People are still, I'm assuming, maybe packing, cleaning up. Staff is helping our, our residents over there. Why was that direction given? That is something that should never happen again in the city of Minneapolis where people have one hour and a half to pack their belongings, their life, and their home. Mr. Chair. The notice of 90 minutes was given with the caveat that if progress is being made, more time will be given. The entire day was given yesterday to clean the encampment. There was no cutoff point. There was a need for a deadline for the beginning of that cleaning process. And so residents worked very hard yesterday. Community members worked very hard yesterday. I understand that because I was actually there where city staff repeatedly said I wasn't welcomed in the encampment. My reasoning for going there was to help make sure people could help people pack. Nobody was stopping the eviction. People showed up to the encampment to help people pack because people have nowhere to go. They don't know where their belongings are at. And to only have initial reports of only 90 minutes to help pack people's belongings, that is something we should never do as a city. And that may be, we may have different opinions from the administration on that, but that's why we're working on a policy to change that. Uh, the last thing I'll say is I would really appreciate over an email uh, the update about the shooting. Uh, this is uh, something that my office is really interested in, where we have folks that called 911 to report guns and safety concerns, and now somebody got shot. So that is very concerning to our neighbors who, in the block who are unhoused and housed. And then I'll pass it to my colleagues. Chair Chavez, um, Council President Payne. I'll look into whatever information we're able to release publicly and get that information to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, CEO Anderson Kelleher. I'll pass it to President Payne. Thank you, Chair Chavez. Um, your timeline outlined a number of closures, right, from the Wall of Forgotten Natives to one location to another, and now I think even today there's a new location. Uh, and I'm just curious about what your theory of change is and whether or not we're tracking by name you, you know, is it the same number of people that have moved from one to the next to the next? I know we've engaged with about 96 folks through Helix. So I would, I want for, if we're going to continue to move people around, is it the expectation that people are going and taking up those shelter beds? Or are we moving the exact same head count from one plot to another to another? Mr. Chair and Council President Payne, I'm going to have David Hewitt come up to discuss the coordinated entry system and what happens in that system. And, and if you could speak specifically to these individuals, because I am fairly familiar with the coordinated entry process as like a in the abstract, but my question specifically about there there should be some by name individuals that have been impacted at this encampment and. I want to know to what extent we have even the capacity to track that and to what extent there's an opportunity for the city to play a better role in that those data practices. Thank you, Chair Chavez, uh, Council President Payne. My name is David Hewitt. I'm the Director of Housing Stability from Hennepin County. I was invited to be present today to answer questions should they arise around the homeless response system as funded operated uh, within Hennepin County's capacity. Uh, with regards to individuals moving from location to location, uh, I mean, one thing that I will highlight, so our Streets to Housing team were present from the 
periodically from the inception of the encampment, the original site, through to the initial fatal shooting, after which we did continue working with individuals, but the safety concerns from our staff were no longer entering. We did continue to see housing outcomes through that period, despite not entering the encampment itself, by continuing to work with individuals. And we continue to work with those individuals irrespective of where they move, when they move, to the best of our ability. Um, that will continue to be the case. The team actually had been out to the newer location specifically to identify who was still there that they had been working with. So we have a essentially a by name list of the people that we have been working with. Now I want to say, to be kind of give a complete picture, that that is not a census of everyone that spent time at the encampment. We spent time at the encampment with our team, we engaged with people, that information goes into a homeless management information system that then any service provider, whether shelter or outreach, can access on encountering an individual to see if they are already connected in the system, already being worked with, already have a housing referral to continue that person's journey into housing. So the, the, the ability to pick up an individual's case at a new location is frankly kind of stepping outside of this specific circumstance is something that is happening all the time within the homeless system where the people move from shelter to shelter or location to location. So it is a challenging environment. It is part of the work that our team and outreach teams like Agus and Aviva and the American Indian Community Development Corporation do and is the homeless management information system that is the kind of one shared source of information on who is working with whom, what services have they accessed, what services are they being referred to, what next steps are needed, understanding that people's cases are, are complex, challenging, everyone's is different, and we're trying to work on pe person-centered solutions with people as quickly as possible. So I hope that answers the question, but feel free to uh, follow up. Yeah, it's my understanding that the city does have one licensee to the HMIS tool, but it's a read-only um, is there an opportunity for us to get into a data sharing agreement so that, because like I, I think to counsel or to Chair Chavez's question, a lot of this is really pinning on do we have an accurate count? Because there's a lot of assumptions that get thrown around or a lot of estimates because the, the situation's dynamic and fluid, right? There are the people who stay over the night, there are the people who come during the day. Us having the capacity to know who is who and who's ready for services, I think is one of the major barriers to getting people into the programs that do exist, let alone do we have the programs that we need to exist. So uh, uh, so question one is, uh, what is, what are the barriers for the city playing a, a, a more of a leadership role in making sure that we have the data practices to have an accurate account? That's question one. And then question two ties to the funding mechanism, especially the with HUD and continuum of care and how that connects to HMIS and whether or not there are limitations on the type of services that we could develop and is there an opportunity for the city to step up as a funding partner to layer on top of the, the floor that HUD establishes in terms of the, the, the level of service? Uh, thank you, Chair Chavez, Council President Payne. Uh, the Homeless Management Information System is a statewide system. Uh, the, it is operated by a nonprofit called the Institute for Community Alliances, uh, and requests for licenses are submitted to the Institute of Community Alliances, uh, and they make a judgment, and they have a, a governing board, which I'm a member of, um, ultimately, but they make judgments around are the purposes for which licenses are being requested aligned with the essentially the release of information that people experiencing homelessness have signed when entering their information into the system. So there is, and let me give a specific example, uh, there is a lot of caution around access to the system. Indeed, it's not granted to law enforcement agencies. That is not seen as an appropriate purpose for having access to the homeless management information system outside of specific uh, kind of warrants and such like. Um, so the city can request them. The business I don't mean would to, be to can you speak up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, hearing yes, notes from the public that it's very hard to hear you on the audio. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Chair Chavez. Uh, the city can request those licenses. Um, the business purpose has to be around coordinating services for individuals specifically to help them address their homelessness. That being the case, um, it seems to me that there would be no reason that the city couldn't add to its pool of users of the homeless management information system if that is the purpose for using it. Uh, does that answer question one? Yes. And then question two was the funding mechanism. Funding mechanism. Yeah. Uh, the like I say, it's a statewide system. It has three primary funding mechanisms. The partnership that oversees it is made up of what are known as continuums of care, of which Hennepin County is one. 
uh, state agencies and the Minnesota Tribal Collaborative. The primary funding is a percentage of HUD funding that comes into our community for homeless services uh, in the region of 3% goes towards the homeless management information system. So it's by formula each year. We actually got our HUD award announcements this week. Our community will receive an increase of $2 million for permanent supportive housing uh, moving forward, which is very exciting, and that includes an increase for additional HMIS capacity, homeless management information system. We are about to go into a change project to change software, which is long overdue. Um, went through a rigorous process of community engagement to get to a better software that we can really design to meet our needs that's a little bit more fit for this day and age than the software that we have been using for the last, well, the whole time I've been here. Um, going into any IT technology change project, you know, we're gonna want things and they're gonna have costs. So that's certainly something that we can talk about uh, because we think there's a lot of opportunity here to move to a much better system that will better enable us to efficiently coordinate services for people who need them and use the homeless management information system really as that care coordination communication tool as opposed to its kind of historical purpose as just federal reporting. That actually, that's actually beyond the question that I asked, but okay. it's very helpful information. That, but uh, the question I'm, I'm, I'm getting at, as we're talking about a healing center or a cultural healing center, we know there's a lot of intersectionality around mental health and substance use disorder. And I'm curious when we're talking about HUD as a funding force for our, source for our service providers, what's the floor of services that, that those dollars can be used for, especially as we're thinking about whether it's the 12-step program, going cold turkey, using medication-assisted therapy for opiates. Like, diff there needs to be different ways of addressing the needs of the community, and I, I, I'm concerned that the sources of funding are putting restrictions that are preventing us from meeting the needs of the community. So I'm just trying to understand to what extent are the restrictions a barrier to actually getting the right type of services for people? Because my previous question is, how many people are taking us up on shelter? And it seems like that number is about zero as we move from one plot to the next. Uh, and I think one of the reasons people are not going to shelter is that we're not meeting their needs where they are, whether that's their mental health needs, their substance use disorder needs, or, or, or whatever they may be. And so if, they're, if the, the federal source of dollars is a barrier on the type of service that we can deliver, can we step up as a city to provide funding so that we can have more culturally appropriate treatment or uh, a higher degree of service? Before you answer that, I just want to, if we could also, today it's mostly on the city's response. I'm happy the county is here. I'm happy that you can answer that question. We're here to hear about the city's response, and if you can answer that, and then just want to remind my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Chavez. Thank you for the, the reframing, uh, Council President Payne. Uh, one thing that I, I feel like I should share in response to the question on the question of shelter. Um, so yesterday, during the day and into the evening, around about 2,500 men, women, and children stayed in emergency shelter in, in Hennepin County. In Hennepin County, funded or partly funded shelters through our nonprofit partners. That is a crisis, and it is an awful lot of people making use of shelter. Approximately 900 children, which is the largest number of families we've ever seen in shelter in our community. So I do want to be clear that in the numbers that have been shared, which are about the number of beds becoming available in the morning, and we've heard about 80 plus, number of beds going completely unused at the end of the evening that haven't been requested, which has been in the region of 20 most nights. But that's the kind of the, the new, new people coming in and what's left over at the end of the evening. We are looking at around about 2,500 people every day using shelter. Um, and huge investments have been made in the shelter system to make that possible. That comes on to your other point. Those huge investments have been through local dollars. Hennepin County pre-pandemic was spending just under $15 million a year on shelter. The number is now more than $40 million a year on shelter. And that's through adding modalities like the American Indian Community Development Corporation Homeward Bound, Avivo Village, converting existing shelters where possible to 24-7, and so on and so forth. Because the federal dollars that come down for homelessness can actually not be used for emergency shelter. They are used aboard for very specific purposes. They are also not explicitly treatment focused. There are really three modalities that the federal continuum of care dollars can be used for. Permanent supportive housing, so paying the rental assistance and the support services for people in their own homes. Rapid rehousing, essentially the same thing, but it's time limited. And transitional housing, uh, which is also a time limited modality during which people are still considered homeless. 
We have about 1,500 people being served in those federal housing programs each year. And as I was saying, with an increase of $2 million moving forwards, that will add uh, about 137 extra beds through through those programs but there are limits to it and certainly when we're looking at treatment when we're looking to these intersectionalities which are so critical especially in some of these uh, more challenging and complex cases like you're saying we need to look at partnerships with other funding streams through our healthcare partners uh, and elsewhere and certainly our healthcare for the homeless which i do not oversee plays a big role in that as well i could add first of all we will seek partnership to seek a license as quickly as possible and see if we can participate in that system you and i had talked about that previously very grateful to understand what the parameters of that are today second of all this what you're hearing is exactly why partnering with the red lake nation and leaders from red lake nation is important because they are interested in this culturally appropriate work for healing and treatment. And I think we would all agree that culturally appropriate healing and treatment is really important here. And so the land that could be transferred is part of the city's contribution to that continuum. And then maybe if I could ask a uh, maybe clarifying question on our shelter capacity. Do we know how many beds are available for people that are actively using opiates? Mr. Chair and President Payne, I do not have that information, but we can get that information from the low barrier shelters. Thank you. Thank you, that'll be very helpful. Thank you, Council President Payne, Council Member Wansley, then we'll have Council Member Vita, and then Council Member Reinville. <laughs> Thank you for getting that correct. <laughs> um, so just a quick uh, follow up on some of the stats that you listed. I know we had Helix as a contractor that you mentioned provided about 96 folks with housing. You have a breakdown um, of the ratio of permanent housing to transitional housing that they provided to folks from Camp Ninikoski. Mr. Chair, uh, Vice Chair Wansley will get that for you. Okay. So nothing. I, I don't have it today. Okay. That actually makes me think of you cited our homeless response team in your presentation and highlighted that on the day of the eviction, they provided some Narcan, um, water and snacks. But what do they actually do prior to uh, eviction? Are they tracking? What? Yeah. Like, what are they actually doing? Mr. Chair and Vice Chair Wansley, I'm going to have uh, Director of Alaska's come up and answer Chair Chavez, Vice Chair Wansley, thank you for the question. So the homeless response team, uh, what they do leading up to an encampment closure is they provide connections. They engage with the um, individuals who are at those specific encampments to try and build trust, to try and offer some additional services, make sure that they're aware that they are trespassing on the property, but at the same time, they're there as a resource to help provide the connection to the county and just keep on working on that relationship day after day that they visit. And some days are, are higher days where people are open and active and willing to engage. Other days, uh, they're not quite there yet. But in those high moments, they do directly connect them to the county, to the streets, to housing team, or to other teams um, from Hennepin County so that we can get them connected into the continuum of care, get them connected with their case managers if, if they have one, or get them connected and start the process to enroll with one. Uh, also offering shelter options, uh, offering, or not shelter, op offering storage options, but then also access and connection to shelter. Is there a system of tracking where, um, I, I can't recall how many are on staff right now under the HRT, but is there a system of tracking, tracking over, let's say, the period of time of the two encampments where they're doing exactly this, marching or marking um, the number of referrals to uh, shelters or um, marking how many folks were referred to wraparound services around, you know, substance use or tracking um, where folks are going either in shelter or permanent housing. Do you all have any notes that you can pull for council right now that says over a period of two months, this is where our HRT provided in terms of like services and referrals? 
Thank you for the question. We do have that information. I don't have it directly in front of me. We have an inter internal tracking tool where we do track every single one of the engagements, the date that they engaged with individuals, went to a specific encampment, how many individuals they engaged with, and what types of uh, services they offered, or if anybody was even receptive to uh, engaging or receiving that information. Thank you. And then back question to um, some of the complaint data too. You mentioned over 100 complaints or 911 complaints earlier. Um, is there also a breakdown between 311 to 911 of that ratio? It seems like 100 complaints over two months. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Chair Chavez, Price, Price uh, Chair Wadsley, the, um, what I gave you uh, in a condensed uh, platform was that August 23rd through uh, uh, January, um, a couple of days ago, when you look at both of those encampments and you look at the 911 data, they were over 100 calls for those two. Um, and then when you look at just the most recent one that we closed yesterday, I, I um, only was able to pull the 311 information at the time. Um, and I just looked at the, had staff look at 311 and got the 311 data um, with the complaints that came to the mayor's office and the departments and just combine them, all three, and that was 100 complaints. 100 complaints from August through what, what January. Was, oh, that, was only, that was only for January for the new encampment. Okay, can we go back to that slide? I just want to get a It wasn't a slide. Oh. I, oh, no, I'm sorry, it is uh -huh. a slide. It is, it a, is slide. a slide. Yeah. Now, if I can go back is a different Here, question. I'll, I'll yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Which one was that? I just want to make sure I'm capturing the date correct. Okay, so I was correct. So it was from August 2023 through January that there was 100 calls. So okay. for 911. For 911. Okay. For both encampments. Excluding 311 data. And yes, that was just 911 data. Okay. So several months versus and but you just said just in January there was also 100 calls. So 100 complaints when you look at 311 mayor's office and the complaints that came into our city departments. Is there a way to get a breakdown of that too? Because again, what you're saying is not reflected in the slide. So, yeah. Are you mean the breakdown of what came into 311, what came into the mayor's office, and then separately what came into the uh, city departments. Is that what you mean by breakdown? Yeah, like what you're saying right now, there was only 100 calls, it seems like, combined of 911 and 100 complaints. 100 complaints. For, th for through 311 and 911 for January, correct? Yes. Can, can okay. I make sure we're on the same page? So that first bullet at the top mm -hmm. that we, I think we're right on the same page, that's the 911 data from August through January, right. and that's 911. Right. When you go down to where you see the first one, it says January 2024, you see 100 complaints as that last sentence, over 100 complaints gotcha. made to 311, Mayor. made to the mayor's office, and made to city departments. So I interpreted your question as you wanted to break down from those three I mean, I guess I'm confused of the overlap because it kind of feels du duplicative. Again, at the top one, you have 100 calls to 911. So is it over 200? I excluded, I excluded 911 okay. on the January 2024 because okay. it was in that top slide. Okay. Was there a reason you No, you know, other than just them? trying to okay. get information and trying to present it as best I could in a short amount of time. If there's some other way... Um, that you would like me to break down that, we can do it um, because that's the information that I asked to be pulled. So it would be an accurate statement to say between 911 and 311 uh, compl or complaints, there were about 200 that came through from August 2023 to January 2024. 
I, I would only have the January data for 311, okay. the mayor's office, and the city departments. I would have to go back to get the months before January 40. So I'd have to go back and get August up to January 40. So August through December 40. And for that particular data, yes. Okay, yeah, that slideshow still feels a little weird. But yes, if you. And Vice Chair Wansley, mm -hmm. this is an undercount, is what it is. Oh, okay. It represents an undercount because the 311 data from August up until, let's say, December. Mm -hmm. is not in that first number. It's only 911 data. Okay. What's in the J the fourth bullet point down is the 311 data that we could pull quickly uh, when we learned the presentation, as well as the, you know, lots of people call the mayor's office still <laughs> when they have a complaint. Uh, and so the mayor's office and other departments, uh, CPED, my office directly, people were reaching out with those. And so that's that hundred. So this is, this is I am most certain an undercount because of the 311 data not being in the August to, it maybe should have, I mean, because the encampment one was closed in early January, we wanna be accurate that we went into January here, December 31st would have been an easier cutoff point, right, for the data. And is there a way to also get a breakdown? This is the first time I've ever seen the mayor's office be included as a data point. Because um, in that case, I can imagine there are some council members here or council offices that have also received maybe complaints. But I also know there's council offices that have received um, like emails of support for the encampment as well. So why that's not included as if we're talking about a full comprehensive understanding of like the breakdown of data points that led us to say, also, eviction is the only piece. Um, this is the first time that I've seen those points. Um, so something to consider moving forward. Um, other question regarding MPD, uh, Commissioner Barnett. So I think everyone has definitely seen videos of um, basically dozens of cop cars surrounding um, encampments during evictions, which is very surprising since we're often hearing about the staffing challenges of MPD and different hot spots of crime and to see, you know, cop cars surrounding unhoused people who don't have anything um, is, is a little jarring. But in light of that, can you talk about, at least for the two uh, encampments, um, about a total of how many staff, MPD staff, of course, I'm assuming patrol, was dispatched for both of those uh, encampments in terms of the evictions? So if you go back to the um, encampments, and some of this has to do with uh, past experiences with encampments. So for the safety concerns that um, uh, we have for uh, employees, the residents um, of the encampment, also the residents surrounding area, MPD looks at trying to approximate how many people will be present and what will they need in worst case scenario. Right, and so that's how they look at the encampment. Um, I can tell you that um, they have to counsel, they have to uh, um, go back and not let people go on vacation uh, and time off in order to be present uh, for those locations. So when you look at, um, I believe the first encampment, and I can uh, try to go back and get the numbers for you, but you have different um, divisions of MPD doing different things. So you do have those folks who are there to secure the perimeter. You have folks who are, are mobile to try to address any um, uh, safety concerns that might occur. Um, you also have um, other teams stand by or station um, if there's additional support. So I believe at the first um, encampment, uh, it took maybe uh, 70 or more officers uh, to be involved uh, to lead up to the work. I don't know that you actually saw that many uh, as far as perimeter is concerned. There are those who are behind the scenes. Uh, and then when it comes to this encampment, 
Uh, I think that number um, would be a little bit larger, uh, and that number, I would suspect, uh, with um, all the estimations, would probably be 90 or so. 90 uh, officers at this last eviction? Involved. So what I took your question to mean is how many MPD officers were involved, whether they were present where you can see them, whether they were supervisors in a different room looking at cameras. I just figured that you were asking the question of how many MPD officers were involved to close an encampment. Yes, the second one. Yes. So, yeah, I said dispatch, which also is very concerning. I believe the third precinct right now, based off of staffing figures, like the total officers there is hovering around maybe a little over 100. So we almost dispatched, totality-wise, an entire precinct, the third precinct alone, for this particular encampment eviction. That is wild. But, but we did, yeah. We, to be clear, uh-huh. uh, there are officers that you don't see, and we don't jeopardize the safety of, of other residents when we do this. So it is planned out to have more officers there than we normally would have on duty. So I'm just saying there's more officers because we're counseling uh, vacations and time off. There's more officers brought in to help. So it's not like here's the number of officers required every day and we took those officers. We asked for volunteers. We get those officers to help. So I hear what you're saying. We did not jeopardize the safety of our residents when we did this. Okay, so two encampment evictions total to about 160 that you use to call the troops in. You're saying that did not take away from uh, response times or anything from other precincts in the midst of that. I just want to get a sense of how many staff was deployed. I didn't ask uh-huh. um, uh, Vice Chair Wansley. I've never asked MPD leadership about response time. Okay. In preparing, I've always asked them because I believe that Chief O'Hare and his leadership are the experts in how is how they need to how many people they need, what uh, they need to make sure everyone is safe. Um, those things are there. I know that uh, in my conversations with Chief O'Hara, and we've talked. Um, we never talked about response time. We've talked about making sure that we were able to respond to other safety needs throughout the city. I, I don't see how those are different of like right. response no, no, time. No, I'm just saying and, I, yeah. when you asked specifically yeah. about response time, I was just making clear mm-hmm. that I'd never asked about response time. I, I never asked him about response time right. in our conversation. Yeah, and I think I was just saying again of how is this impacting, I'm assuming if you're taking or asking folks to maybe come and support, how does that ultimately impact response time for other problem nature codes? Right. So something else, again, a metric point to track as you're dis- deploying, again, 90 officers, 70 officers, over 160 just for two encampments over like four months. So just wanted to flag that another data point. Um, But outside of that, you answer those questions. Um, I think everyone has kind of emphasized the overall talking point of like, no one here thinks encampments is a dignified response, but we also know the whack-a-mole approach is not working. Um, And there is alignment with if we truly want um, dignified housing solutions or solutions to our encampments, which according to the mayor, that's what he also says he wants, we have to do better around the coordination of that, Um, being more intentional of how we're using our resources, because I did hear we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars of resources on these evictions. I think we all would love to see that go towards maybe supporting a homeless response team, maybe supporting a couple more contractors to be responsive to these sites and to get people into permanent and transitional housing. So I think that is going to be the ongoing conversations that we have. Council member and Chair Chavez talked about the policy solutions that council is going to take up. I also want to flag for this committee as we're going to next week, Uh, We have budget on Monday um, where we're going to talk about um, the unspent rollovers for 2023. 
that gives us an opportunity to also put our money where our mouth is when we're talking about supporting solutions. So I know I'm going to be having conversations with colleagues about how we can use some of those uncommitted rollover dollars to actually fund us going in this direction of a public health approach um, and broadening the scope outside of um, ineffective evic evictions. Um, when we're trying to support our unhoused neighbors. Um, so I just wanted to flag that as another opportunity as we're complementing the work that you are leading Chair Chavez and several other council members on creating a humane and robust approach when it comes to our encampments. So thank you all for answering my questions. Um, clearly this is gonna be an ongoing conversation until we stop doing evictions overall. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Wansley, uh, Council Member Vita. Thank, thank you, Chair Chavez, for allowing me to speak. I'm here today because I was previously the chair of this committee and had started to do lots of work because I had hundreds, if not close to a thousand people from uh, wards where these encampments are reach out to me to say that they didn't feel like their voices were being heard at City Hall, that they didn't feel represented at City Hall when conversations was happening about um, encampments in these neighborhoods. So, um, you know, I, I was it was ha I was happy to hear Chair Chavez say that, you know, we don't need to pit people against each other and that we should work on this together. I like that that's the direction he's going in. But what I didn't hear was him ask any questions that were related to the people who live in these neighborhoods. I want to just um, have you all picture what these few stories I'm going to tell. So on Friday, I went to go meet a group of neighbors uh, that live on 26th and 14th Avenue who wanted to talk about what they had been experiencing in their neighborhood with the two camps. Um, I myself am a cancer survivor, so I sympathize with anyone who's battling cancer. And what I saw when I walked into this particular house felt and looked like where I went every Friday for almost eight years to get chemotherapy. Lots of ill people sitting around, poisoning themselves, trying to make themselves better. All these people in this house we're talking about the illnesses that they deal with every single day and how these camps trigger them. I talked to a couple who has a two-week-old baby that they just brought home that was terrified that the baby was going to be sent back because the social worker had to come out and do um, an assessment of their house, and the smoke in the air was terrible. They have air quality monitors in the alleys, and in these monitors, they've seen levels that are um, forest fire levels in California. So I can't sit there as a person and act like I'm not hearing this. I saw people who are several people in this room who are battling cancer. All these people said, I'm scared. I can't stand up for myself. If I stand up for myself, I'm going to be retaliated against because we're all white. We're all white. We're old. We live in this neighborhood. We don't have a voice. That's not okay. That's not okay at all. They should have a voice also. So after I finished my time with the neighbors, I just casually walked over to the camp and walked in. I had a good time with Nicole, the organizer. I talked to Nicole about personal things, like how I met her was down here at City Hall to uh, save her granddaughter from arsenic that she thought was at the Roof Depot. And I asked Nicole flat out, I said, how do you get to protect your granddaughters, your granddaughter, but the people in this neighborhood don't get to protect their babies? And she said, you know what? I hadn't thought of that. That's not okay. You're right. It's not okay that some of us feel protected and others don't. But what I saw more than anything is, and I shared this with them in the camp, I was a child of someone who was addicted to crack. That was the most ugly, painful time in my family's lives. The addiction that I saw in that camp gutted me. These, these activists are painting this picture of some type of utopian like camp where everybody, that is not what I saw. I saw addiction. I saw a need for help. I agree, we don't need MPD in there. 
That to me is a place for our unarmed public safety groups to go into and help and provide the resources they have. I, tr bringing the police in there is probably more traumatizing and we don't need to criminalize addiction. The people in there are addicted. It's addiction in there. I had three women say, I want my kids back. I was one of those kids. I was taken away from my mother. And guess what? When I wasn't with her, every single day, I cried. I worry. Where is she? Is she coming back tonight? Is she alive? Is somebody going to say that she didn't make it? Crack was terrible. Terrible. And opioids are worse when you've seen it firsthand. When you've seen this addiction, when this hit your family, when this hit your life, you can't be okay with this. This is not okay. It's not about the response. It's about what we're allowing as a city. I talked to the chief Monday and I said to him, I said, chief, over the weekend, I thought to myself, what happens if this camp gets a bad batch of drugs? What people don't understand about addiction is addicts run to what we see as bad, as non Addicts as what we see as bad drugs. Councilman Rita, do you have a question for city staff? What people don't understand is you have a question. We're for city risking. Staff. Council member Vita. If you want to shut me down, just shut me I'm down. Asking if you have a question Because I thought this staff. was about both sides. You can. You are welcome to, but I'm asking if you have a question. I didn't know I had staff. to have a question. I could talk it seems if like I you're wanted assigning to. One, you're assigning motives to city council members on the dais, and you're assigning motives. Well, to you just said cameras. everything you wanted to say. If you don't want me to speak, just say I don't want you to I'm speak. You so questions. you can go on the record. I'm go. speaking. Go ahead. You proceed, so I can go on the record. What I'm talking about is my experience as a council member in the camp and yeah. also with the neighbors. 100%. I the understand. reality of it. 100%. Not the fake, I'm going to stand outside in front of a camera of it. 100%. The I'm actual you, real thing that's going on. And I'm asking you to not assign motive. And what you saying ain't it, members. chair. I'm asking you to not you, assign motive. These people to council members. need us to help them, not to use them as political pawns. Period. That's what they need. You go ahead and just you up here talking you not a member of this committee and doing nothing. I am going to ask you to stop. Like I said, I saw it firsthand. You Our staff not. is put on trial for going over and doing the job that we've asked them to do. I'm sorry, staff. Y'all don't deserve this. Your families are being threatened. And Chair Chavez going home every night going to sleep. You and not. your families are being threatened. You don't deserve this. You all are amazing, Ricks every single one of you. He is a fraud. He is behind the scenes telling Vita. staff what they're not going to do. I'm what I said is what I said. I said what I disposal. said. These neighbors need to be heard by their council member who won't respond to them. And you can have it. And you can have it. And you can have it. I support it. I support it. You can't make up one, Nicole. You can't make up one, Nicole. Nicole, the treatment center is not going to have you in charge of it. He's using you. He's using you. I said what I said. He's using. They, I refuse. I refuse. I re don't come down here by me. Don't come down here by me. I refuse. I refuse to let this continue to happen. Staff is being badgered and treated like crap. He can't because he knows I'm telling will, the truth. I will. There is no further business before us. I'm going to remind my colleagues to never, especially if you are not a member of this committee, Come and disrespect. Save your reminder. I say what I want to say. I have the same election vote. certificate you, you have. And the way you treat no staff is how I'm going to treat you for us. the next two I years. Declare this you show condition, but you can't take it, can you? Elected officials that you have election certificates. You just put them on trial the with 10 questions that had nothing not to do with the people who you represent in Ward 9 that are sitting here. And you will not disrespect the public. Okay. Why, why, why? We I got a tiny a violin for you. Hold, and you have failed that standard. Thank you. We oh, are adjourned. Oh, thank you. Sorry, staff. You don't deserve this.